In this video, we'll be looking at gases and gas laws. The first thing we want to do with gases is go through something called kinetic molecular theory. And what kinetic molecular theory is, is it's a series of assumptions that give a simplified view of gas particle behavior. Because if you can visualize what's happening with the particles, it makes understanding the laws that we're talking about much easier. Now these are a series of assumptions or simplifications that allow us to get a more clear picture of what's happening by kind of avoiding some of the complexities that don't really matter most of the time. So the first point in kinetic molecular theory is gas particles are treated as points. What that means is we don't worry about the volume of the individual particles themselves because they're so small compared to the volume that they are occupying. The actual volume of the individual particles is so small, we don't need to worry about them. Now, do they have volumes? Yes, but we can safely ignore the volume of the particles 99% of the time, so we can make this kind of simplification. Our second point for kinetic molecular theory is that there are no attractive or repulsive forces between the particles. Now again, this isn't necessarily 100% true. There are attractive forces between the particles. They are just very, very, very weak. They're so weak that 99% of the time, we can just ignore them. So that's another simplification we can make. We can also say that collisions are elastic, that any time these particles hit something else, they're just going to rebound off of that perfectly and continue on their way. We also say that the kinetic energy of the particles is directly related to the temperature. What that means is that at higher temperatures, particles will move faster. At lower temperatures, they will move much more slowly. We have four different properties that we use to describe gases. And what these properties are, are these are the observables. These are things you can collect data on. These are things that you can measure. And our four properties that we're going to be looking at are pressure, volume, amount, and temperature. And each one of these properties have relationships with the other properties. And these relationships are both qualitative and quantitative. For us, we won't really worry about the quantitative relationships. We'll be focusing on the qualitative relationships. The first property we want to talk about is pressure. And what pressure is, is pressure is the force that's exerted when the particles hit the walls of the container that hold the gas. Every time one of these tiny particles hit the wall of the container, they're going to exert a force on that wall of the container. Just like if you were to hit the wall with your hand or your fist, you'd be exerting a force on that wall. Same thing is happening with the gas particles hitting the wall of their container. There's many different pressure units that are out there. It kind of turns out that each different scientific discipline has their favorites. You're probably familiar with some of these. You may have heard of inches of mercury. That's the way we measure atmospheric pressure. So the weather app on your phone, when it says the pressure today is 29.98 or 30.04, well, that's being measured in inches of mercury. Kind of related to that is just a metric millimeters of mercury. You'll sometimes often see things like bar or millibar used in weather and meteorology. Things like tropical storms, you'll often hear about the pressure in the eye of the storm or the eye of the hurricane being measured in bars or millibars. They're often used for weather. The one we're probably most familiar with is PSI, pounds per square inch. 
you're familiar with that one for things like your car tires when it says inflate to 35 well it generally means 35 psi or if you have an inflatable ball like a basketball or a football it may say inflate to this number of psi's sometimes pascals are also used in engineering they're another pressure unit the ones you most likely find in chemistry are millimeters of mercury, which is a named unit that's sometimes called a tor, and atmospheres. Those are the ones you see most often in chemistry. You don't have to worry about memorizing any conversions between the pressure units. Conversions are always going to be provided to get you between the different pressure units. Our next property is volume. Volume for a gas is just like volume for anything else. It's the amount of space that's occupied. And any volume units can be used. Generally, we're going to try to lean towards the metric ones. So if you had a little bit of gas, you might be using milliliters, more liters. If you had even more, kiloliters. If you were doing some atmospheric science work you might have even a bigger metric prefix in there but volume is just that amount of space that gets occupied now the amount the amount we have to pause here because for other things you've sometimes almost used amount and volume almost as synonyms of each other you know, think about the amount of water you need for the experiment is 10 milliliters. Well, there you're using amount and volume interchangeably. And you can do that for liquids and solids because they're tied into each other. The volume won't be changing. You can't do that for gases. Amount and volume are very, very different when you're dealing with a gas. Volume is how much space is occupied whereas amount is how much actual material is present. So for amount, usually we're looking at things like grams and moles for our amount units. And to kind of show you why it's so important that we really distinguish between volume and amount for gases, I want to draw just a very simple diagram. I can have gas particles, if I put three gas particles in here represented by the X's, those gas particles can take up various amounts of volume. They can take up a small volume, or they could take up a much larger volume. Here, the volume in each case is different. The one on the left has a much smaller volume than the one on the right, but the amount of gas, three particles in this case, is the same. So I just wanted you to see the differences between volume and amount. Temperature for temperature we're dealing with kind of relating back to the kinetic molecular theory that we started with how fast the particles are traveling. We have three different temperature scales we can use Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin. Kelvin gets used most often because it's an absolute temperature scale. Remember, there are no negative numbers. When you don't have negative numbers, it makes the calculations much easier. Example, minus 20 versus plus 20. If we are using those numbers in the equation, that negative, and 20, negative 20 and positive 20 would look very similar, and that would cause a problem. But if you converted those to Kelvin, they would be much different. You could clearly see that temperature difference. We're not going to be dealing with any temperature calculations, so we won't really need to worry about this, but if you ever have to, in the future, deal with temperature calculations, you're going to see that most likely you'll probably be dealing with those in Kelvin. So what we want to do next is talk about a series of gas laws, and each gas law has a name, and each gas law describes a relationship between two different properties. Remember, there are four total properties, so it's describing how two of the properties are related to each other. 
So as you're describing how two are related, that means the other two that you're not discussing in that property have to be held constant. So that's what we're going to see for each gas law. We're going to discuss the relationship between two properties and the other two properties will be held constant. So our first gas law we want to talk about is Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law deals with the inverse relationship between pressure and volume. When you see inverse, that kind of means opposite. So pressure and volume will have an opposite relationship. As one of those properties increases, the other one will decrease. You're going to see that opposite relationship. One goes up, one goes down. One goes down, the other one goes up. One has to be increasing, the other one has to be decreasing. In order to see this relationship, amount and temperature are constant. So below we have a diagram of Boyle's Law. This is showing what happens if we decrease the volume in a chamber. So we have the same number of gas particles in each case. If you count the number of red dots, you're going to see five gas particles in there. And remember, you're getting pressure every time these particles hit the walls of the container. So on the left-hand side, there is a relatively large volume. So being there's a large volume, the particles have more space. If they have more space, they will hit the walls of the container less frequently. If they're hitting the walls of the container less frequently, you will get a lower pressure. So on the left, you see a large volume, but a small pressure. On the diagram on the right, when you look at it, here you have a much smaller volume. Being you have a much smaller volume, there's less room for the gas particles to move freely. They will hit the walls of the container more often. If they hit the walls of the container more often, you're going to get more pressure. Remember, that's where we're getting pressure from, from collisions with the walls of the container. On the right, because of the small volume, you will get more collisions with the container. More collisions will lead to a higher pressure. So volume and pressure have this inverse relationship. If one increases, the other one decreases. They're doing the opposite thing that the other one is doing. Next gas law we want to talk about is Charles Law. What Charles Law is, is Charles Law is that direct relationship between temperature and volume. In a direct relationship, what you'll see is the same effect. So as one increases, the other one increases as well. You're doing the same thing. One goes up, the other goes up. If one goes down, the other one would go down. Remember, your other properties would have to be held constant. So amount and pressure would be held constant for this. And a good visualization for what's happening with Charles' Law is what's happening with a balloon. You know that as you heat a balloon, so if we start with a balloon at room temperature, as we heat it, you know that the balloon expands. You get a larger volume. We're very familiar with that. If you've ever taken a balloon out on a cold day or stuck it in the freezer, do the exact opposite, you know that the balloon tends to shrink. It's not going to be as large. So here, just by what you know with what happens for a balloon, you can see and have an understanding of what's going on with Charles' Law. Next law we want to talk about is the Guy-Lussac Law. And the Guy-Lussac Law is a direct relationship between temperature and pressure. And as one increases, the other one increases. Remember, direct relationships give you that same effect. Remember, our other properties, amount and volume, have to be held constant in order to see this. And the way to visualize this is imagine you have a sealed, rigid chamber. The gas particles are represented by the blue dots. So on the left, you see the blue dots, and you have the same number of blue dots, 
and you can see they're moving very slowly. That's represented by the very small tails you see on those blue dots. In the diagram on the right, you see the flames at the bottom as you heat this chamber with the gas. As you increase the temperature of those gas particles, they're going to move faster. We saw that in our kind of assumptions with kinetic molecular theory. So that's represented by kind of the longer tails on those blue dots, showing that they're moving faster. Well, if they're moving faster, two things are going to happen. One is they'll hit the walls of the container more often because they're just traveling faster. And the second thing that will happen is every time they hit the wall of the container, they'll hit it with more force because they are traveling faster. Remember, that's where we're getting pressure from. The force that's exerted when the particles hit the walls of the container. The diagram on the right, the particles will hit the walls of the container more often. And every time they hit the walls of the container, they're going to hit with more force that's going to cause the pressure to increase. So increasing the temperature will increase the pressure. If you decrease the temperature, you would decrease the pressure. You have this direct relationship between temperature and pressure. Last of these type of gas laws we're going to talk about is Avogadro's law. And in Avogadro's law, we look at the direct relationship between amount and volume. Remember, in a direct relationship, that's the same effect, the same thing's going to happen. As one increases, the other one increases. If one goes down, the other one goes down. Here, temperature and pressure are constant again. And here, we can use balloons for our example again. Balloons are our most common thing we use kind of when we're dealing with gases. Think about it. When you blow more air into a balloon, the volume of the balloon gets bigger. When you let the air out of a balloon, well, the volume of the balloon gets smaller. You see that direct relationship again. So for Avogadro's law, you just have to think about what happens when you blow more air into a balloon or you let air out of that balloon. The last gas law we're going to talk about is not related to the previous four. In the previous four, we saw how different properties are related to each other. The last gas law just deals with pressure. It's the only gas law we're going to do any quantitative work with. So here we're looking at Dalton's law of partial pressures. So in Dalton's law of partial pressures, what it says is in a mixture of gases, the total pressure is equal to the sum of each individual gas's partial pressure. So we can kind of put that in more of an equation type form. The total pressure is just equal to all of the individual pressures of each gas added together. So if we had three gases, pressure one plus pressure two plus pressure three, this could go on and on. If we had a fourth gas, a fifth gas, a sixth gas, a seventh gas, we would just add up all of the individual pressures in order to get that total. Now there's two things to know to be able to deal with Dalton's law of partial pressures. The first is kind of just what the law is saying, is that the sum of all the parts, adding up all the parts together, is going to equal the total. The second thing we want to be on the lookout for are units. Everything must be in the same units as we're adding or subtracting. You can think about this the same way as if you had three objects that you were weighing. If you had the weight of all three of those objects in different units, if you had one in grams, one in milligrams, and one in ounces, you couldn't just add those numbers together to give you that total mass or that total weight of all the objects you would first have to convert them into the same unit. Well, if you would have to do that for objects in determining a total mass, you would also have to use that same principle of everything being in the same unit in order to deal with these gases and those pressures. 
So we want to do a Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure problem. So this problem reads, a mixture of three gases has a total pressure of 9.99 atmospheres. If the pressure of the neon is 34.2 psi and the pressure of the argon is 800 torr, what is the pressure of the krypton? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to kind of change things into looking like a Dalton's Law partial pressure problem. We're going to get things out of the word problem and into a form that we can deal with. Well, Dalton's Law of partial pressure says that the total pressure is going to equal the sum of each of the individual gases, individual pressure added together. So what gases do we have? Well, we have neon gas, argon gas, and krypton gas. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull the useful information out of the word problem without doing any manipulations to it yet. So the total pressure is 9.9 .9 atmospheres. We'll get that in there. Pressure of the neon, 34.2 psi. Pressure of the argon is 800 torr. And what we're looking for is that pressure of the krypton. So now we have this in the form of a Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures problem, but we have a little bit of an issue. Our issue is when we look at our units, we're all in different units. We have atmospheres, PSI, and TOR. Well, before we can do anything with that, we're going to have to get into the same unit. Everything must be in that same unit. Sometimes the problem will tell you what unit you want to have your final answer in. Sometimes they'll leave it up to you. In this case, the problem is not specific, so we can pick any pressure unit we want. In this one, I just kind of picked atmospheres as the pressure unit that we're going for. Well, for this one, for the total pressure, we're already in atmospheres. So our 9.99 .9 atmospheres... Well, we don't have to do anything with that. But for the pressure of the neon, we have to convert the pressure of the neon into atmospheres. Well, that's okay. That's just going to be a one-step conversion that we're going to do on the side. We're starting with 34.2 PSI, and then we're going to convert that to atmospheres. Remember, you're going to be provided the conversion between atmospheres and PSI. One atmosphere equals 14.7 PSI. You don't have to memorize that. That would be provided for you. But we need to set that up in a one-step conversion. PSIs are in the numerator, so we'll put our PSIs in the denominator. Atmospheres will be in the numerator. And this is a one-step unit conversion problem where our PSIs are going to cancel. The unit we're going to have left is atmospheres. So 34.2 divided by 14.7 will convert those PSIs to atmospheres. And we end up with 2.32 atmospheres for this. So we end up with our 2.32 atmospheres. So we successfully converted our 34.2 PSI into atmospheres. Now we're going to do a similar process for the tor. For the argon, we have 800 tor. Well, we want to convert that into atmospheres. So we're going to start with our 800 tor. We want to convert that into atmospheres. Remember, you're going to be provided the conversion factors. You don't have to memorize them. The conversion between tor and atmospheres is that one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor. We already have TORs in the numerator, so we would put TOR in the denominator, leaving atmospheres in the numerator. So now you would see that we would have TORs in the numerator that will cancel with the TOR in the denominator, leaving us with atmospheres as our units. When we do the calculation, 800 divided by 760, we would get 1.05 atmospheres. So we converted the TOR to atmospheres. So I'm just kind of reviewing what we did so far. We put it in the form of a Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure problem. 
we extracted all of the data, all of the information from the problem without doing any manipulations right away. Now we saw that we had a unit issue. We had to get things in the same unit. So now we're working on getting things into a consistent unit. We chose atmospheres for this. Our total pressure was already in atmospheres, so we were good with that. We converted our PSI into atmospheres. We converted our TOR into atmospheres. So it's at this stage where we have everything in the same unit, atmosphere. So we can just figure out what that missing piece is. And our missing piece is going to be the pressure of that krypton. So how do we determine that? Well, that missing piece, we take 9.99 atmospheres, subtract off our known pieces, 2.32 atmospheres and 1.05 atmospheres. That means the rest of it has to come from the pressure of the krypton. So we would determine that the pressure of the krypton, 6.62 atmospheres. Remember, you can go back and double check this. Remember, we're always better adding numbers as opposed to subtracting numbers. You can go back and double check this. If this is correct, when we go back and put this in here and you add up all of the parts, you should get the total. If you get the total from adding up all the parts, then you did it correctly. If you don't get the total from adding up all the parts, then one of your parts is wrong and you want to go back and kind of check that out to make sure what part kind of was wrong with that. But here, our total was 9.99 atmospheres. That's got to be the sum of all the pieces. 2.32 of it is accounted for and came from the neon. 1.05 is accounted for, came from the argon. That means the rest of it had to come from the krypton. And that makes our total pressure for the krypton coming in at 6.62 atmospheres.